my pastor and his wife, said, Michelle, let's take you to Missouri to check out this amazing recovery group and um, see maybe if you would want to do to start something like that for your community and you can use our church to do it. So whether they know this or not, um, they're, they've been very instrumental in my journey and in my recovery. I'm going to tell you why in just a second. But we're really, we were really impressed um, as to how it was set up, and I was extremely amazed. I had already been teaching a Celebrate Recovery group here on Monday nights for the ladies. But this gave me some experience in outside meetings and how to facilitate them. Um, their group fired me up, and I come back on fire and encouraged me to do more than not just for my church and community, but for the transition ladies so they could have something once they complete the program and graduate that they could have a place in the community to come to and um, just have a recovery community. Um, Stacy Stanley and her husband Shannon Stanley lead the Riverbend Recovery in New Madrid and Parma, Missouri for both men and women, and they've been doing that for the past five years. And they are changing lives and are doing it through the power of Jesus Christ. Um, so it is my pleasure to introduce Stacy Stanley as our speaker. And I just want to say Shannon and them were very instrumental in mine and Angel's um, journey because they encouraged us to become CPRSs, which is Certified Peer Recovery Specialist. And so now we are that for the state of Tennessee. And so anyway, this is Stacy Stanley and y'all are going to want to miss this. Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> As she said, my name is Stacy Stanley, and I want to share with you how God transformed my life and, most importantly, my heart. My story is one of brokenness, but also of grace, redemption, and God's unrelenting love. From an early age, I struggle with self image feeling like I wasn't good enough. I remember my family doctor grabbing me, my face and telling me at a little, as a little girl that I was too pretty to be so fat. So at a very young age, I was prescribed diet pills. As a middle daughter, I grew up overshadowed by my sisters, feeling like, like the fat, ugly one. While in my mind, thinking they were everything I wasn't. Pretty, popular, and most of all, thin. When I was around seven years old, my mom made a choice to start going to a new church. This caused tension with my other family members, and somehow I felt responsible for protecting her. This is when I look back that I see that I was developing a deep sense of codependency. I wanna be clear, this was not my mother's fault, but as a child, I misinterpreted my role. I felt I had to be her protector, which drove me to constantly seeking her approval as well as other people's and validation. This codependency distorted my understanding of healthy relationships, which only added to my emotional turmoil. As time went by, my weight became the focal point of my life. Seeking validation, I turned to dangerous methods like diet pills, including Fin Fin in the early 90s which now I have um, heart valve damage because of that. I doctor shopped so I could be on them constantly and never with that period of time when you had to be off of them. So I'd go, I even went to doctors in uh, other states to get the medicine. Um, these choices didn't solve my problems. The misuse of these pills multiplied my anxiety causing constant irritability and frequent emotional outbursts. My negative self-image deepened, leading to obsessive behaviors 
including bulimia. The stress left me both physically and emotionally exhausted, and I found myself fighting depression. The strain this placed on my relationships was immense. Communication with my family and friends broke down, and emotional distance grew, especially as I became, I became more and more defensive about my weight and my health habits. At this time, I'm gonna read parts of a letter that I asked my youngest sister to send to me when I was in federal prison. I was, I was in the RDAP program. I was trying to figure out what, what caused my choices, why I acted like I did. And this is part of her letter to me. For a long time, our family has talked about how different you are from what you used to be. You used to be so jolly and loved everyone. Then as you got older, you became infatuated with wanting to be thin. This took its toll not only on you, but our whole family. Your whole personality changed. We got to where we were scared to say anything to you. We never knew how you would take it. GL and I, that's my brother-in-law and my pastor, still joke about how you would twist everything that my husband Shannon said to be bad. He would, this is an example. He would say, wow, Stace, that dress sure looks pretty on you. And I would say, so I guess you're saying the one I wore yesterday looked terrible. This from my sister. She said, I'll also never forget the time when my best friend and I would come to church with me. One night we were sitting in the parking lot of church and you remember how stupid that Tara and I acted together. We laughed about everything. Even stuff that wasn't funny they would laugh about. Well, I sneezed and without even thinking, my sister said, shut up instead of bless you. And I slapped her. She said, you slapped, my, you slapped the fire out of my face. That not only embarrassed me, but it hurt my feelings. I didn't see that coming, but I think that was part of your mood swings. You went from being the best sister in the world to being my worst enemy. The worst one ever through that time and my daughter Meredith, she was just a baby. She said, you and Shannon had been fighting and you went crazy. I was at mom's with my son Tripp, Mommy Tripp, who was only about a month old and we also had Meredith there. You, you were spazzing out, barged through mom's door and was going to try to take Meredith but we knew you were in no shape to take, the ba take her, so I wouldn't let you have her. You chased me, and I ran into the bathroom with both babies and locked the door. Then I started crying. I couldn't believe it. My family would ever be in the middle of something like this. While I was locked in there, you ran through the house. You and mom ended up in the living room and you slapped mom in the face. I had at that time come out of the bathroom and that's when little Johnny, which is our baby brother, grabbed you, threw you down on the couch and sat on you, held you down until the police came. GL and Shannon came in too. We were all so upset over that. We never dreamed in a million years that you would ever physically hurt mom I'll never forget the way she looked when that happened. It still tears me up to this day. There's many more stories she said she could have said. She didn't go into that. So, little history background there. So, 
After about four years of an on and off again relationship, I married Shannon, my husband now, in 1992, hoping for a fresh start and a stable life. But with my continued use of diet pills and feelings of self-worth, comparing myself to others and constant mistrust, our relationship was everything but what I had created in my mind of a fairy tale. Then, with Shan his serious car accident in 1999, which led to an opioid and gambling addiction, our marriage unraveled even more. The struggles, trust issues, and addiction took their toll. Despite divorcing, remarrying, and trying to make it work, Shannon fell into meth addiction, and by 2007, we divorced for the second time. The years of trust issues, control, and addiction had left my heart hardened, completely numb to God and others. As I lost control over my life, I turned to desperate measures. Between Shannon's addictions and my own battles with eating disorders, as well as a shopping addiction, I became emotionally numb. I was simply surviving, doing what I could to hold everything together, including making disastrous choices like embezzling money from my employer to cope with financial strain. I was so trapped in cycles of shame and guilt that I couldn't see a way out. I couldn't feel anymore, neither God's presence nor any real joy. I had become so distant from who I once was and from the faith that had always been part of my life. My heart had hardened to protect me from pain, but in the process, I also shut out my chance of healing. Eventually, my actions caught up with me in 2005, my life came crashing down. I confessed the embezzlement as well as an affair I had had with my boss to my husband and my pastor. Later, I stood in court and pled guilty to three counts of forgery and was sentenced to 30 months in federal prison. This was the lowest point of my life, but also the beginning of God's intervention. You see, I was trying to live two worlds at one time. During these years, I had been living a lie. While active in the church, partic particularly in the music ministry, I played the drums and sang. I privately battled these struggles. The weight of my secret sin brought repro reproach to my church and to my family. Deeply ashamed, I felt trapped in a cycle of hidden brokenness while trying to appear put together. With the weight of shame, guilt, and disappointment, I plunged into a very dark place. But God said, your life isn't over. And he was going to turn it all around for his good. By the grace of God, I am here today. Stand, standing in his grace and healing. Upon arriving in federal prison in 2008, July of 2008, I was in charge of orientation for every new lady who arrived. Looking back now, I see that even then, God was preparing me for the purpose he had in my life today. I turned 40 years old in prison in December of 2008. Re this is a reflection in my mind of my time in the wilderness. God didn't call me by my sin. He called me by the name I took on when I was baptized at eight years old, and that was Jesus. In September of 2009, while I was in prison, I completed the nine-month residential drug abuse program. At my attorney's request, in suggestion to reduce my sentence. Initially, I didn't admit I had a problem. I justified it by saying I wasn't using illegal drugs. But the truth is, it was no different. Through RDAP, I began to dig deep into the root of my problems 
and started to understand why I acted the way I did. God's promise in Ezekiel 36, 26 says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. This is what he did for me. He took my heart hardened by years of pain, shame, and guilt and, re and replaced it with a heart that could finally feel again, one that could receive as well as give his love and forgiveness. I like to say all the time that I had a heart transplant. I had a spiritual heart transplant. And just like a physical heart, heart transplant, your body has to adjust to that because it, it tries to reject that. So it's a daily battle with me. I have to constantly work on those adjust, adjustments to keep that heart healthy, that spiritual heart that God gave me healthy. This process was not easy. It meant surrendering everything I thought I needed. I was powerless. I had to throw up that white flag of surrender and give up doing the things my way and allow him to be God in my life. God showed me that the things I once sought for validation would never satisfy me. Only he could feel that deep longing in my soul. My identity was no longer, longer in what I had done or how I looked, but in who God said I was. Amen. He said and says, I am loved. He loves me unconditionally. My value isn't based on my performance or past, but in his love. I am forgiven. I am forgiven from the past mistakes and choices that I made, no matter how big they may seem. I don't have to carry that burden and guilt and shame anymore. I am a new creation. Second yes. Corinthians 5 and 17 says that if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. My old identity is replaced with a new life in him. I am empowered through Christ. I have the Holy Spirit within me to guide and strengthen me. I'm not defined by my struggles, but by God's power working in me. I have a purpose. Ephesians 2 and 10 says, I am God's workmanship. I was created to do good works that he has planned for me. I have a unique role and purpose in God's plan. I am redeemed and set free. Amen. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Right. I stand firm then, and, and I do not let myself again be burdened by that yoke of slavery. I am free from sin and shame and anything else that holds me captive. I am chosen and called. 1 Peter 2 and 9 says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him. Christ has specifically chosen me, right. you, for his purpose. Right. I am his masterpiece. Yes. Ephesians 2 and 10, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God, he prepared in advance for me to do, for you to do. You are not, you, you are uniquely crafted with a divine purpose in mind. I am heir to his promises. Romans eight seventeen. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. I share in God's inheritance, which in, includes eternal life and a relationship with God. Yes. By believing in these promises and internalizing them, I can live confidently knowing who I am in Christ, fully loved, fully forgiven, and divinely purposed. Nothing was a coincidence. It was all part of his plan. Very recently, God began to show me something profound. Until I sought him with the same passion 
that I had sought over all those years. The things, including my husband, material things, prestige, until I sought him with that same passion, that empty place would never be filled. He stripped away everything I had used to define myself because he knew I wouldn't become who I was meant to be until I found my worth in him. I stand before you today, not as someone who has lived a perfect life, but as someone who has walked through deep despair and hopelessness and found redemption and hope in God's grace and unending mercy. Today, I live with a heart open to God's purpose for my life. I no longer seek validation in my appearance, material things, or relationships. Instead, I seek God. And He has given me a purpose far greater than I ever imagined. Now, today, I mentor and sponsor women in recovery, helping them find the same grace and freedom that I found in Christ. I no, no longer live for approval from others, but serve God with joy, sharing that message of hope and redemption to others. I have a beautiful daughter, Meredith, who just turned 30, and her husband, Richard, they are the student pastors at Riverbend Pentecostals in New Madrid. They gave me my first grandchild, Tate Michael, February 25th this year. John Michael, our son, who will be 22 years old in February, is also living for God and active in our church. To conclude, I want to emphasize that God can heal any broken heart, restore any lost relationship, and transform any life. No matter where you are or what you've done, God is calling you to Him. He wants to take your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh, a heart that beats in rhythm with His grace and love. I see the evidence of His goodness all over my life. All throughout my history, I see His promises in fulfillment. His faithfulness is right beside me. The winter storms made way to spring in every season from where I'm standing. But I see the promises coming full circle that God promised me. Thank you today for allowing me to share my story today.